Well, welcome back for a very special episode of the Chamber Podcast. This is obviously a remote episode as I'm recording, not from the studio today, but in my office. So joining me on the show today is former global CMO of General Motors, Deborah Wall. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. And that's not where your resume stops. Uh, obviously, uh, marketing Hall of Famer, uh, board of directors. Uh, I even saw a Detroit advocate on your profile, which you know, we need more people like that. Uh, in this world. So how's your morning going? It is a fabulous morning. Um, Today is beginning of fall here and it's my absolute favorite time of year. Crisp, clear, and good for thinking and lots of action. Absolutely. Fall is one of my favorite, actually it is my favorite season as well. Um, Especially fall in Michigan. It's, it's, uh, it's quite beautiful. So, so Deborah, you have a, you have a tremendous background experience in in the area of marketing and advertising. So I want to start off by just telling a quick origin story. Um, Obviously no one comes out of college at 22 and becomes the SVP CMO of General Motors. Uh, So tell me a little bit, your background and how you uh, kind of grew into that role and then, you know, achieve hall of fame status in the marketing world. Um, okay. That's a quick, you know, a quick yeah, thing. So, uh, all in 30 <laughs> seconds, if you can yeah, do it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. You know, I always say, um, when you're young, you should be motivated by your curiosity and try to find what you love to do. And I know, um, I was always uh, very driven um, and ambitious, so not afraid of hard work or really going the limits. But I think what was really important in several stages of my career, I went from finance to international work to finally, um, after about 10 years into my career, I had a real moment of what do I really want to do? What what drives me the most? What do I love the most? Because I was debating, do I go into general management, try to be a CEO, do that? And as I did a sort of an, uh, a moral inventory or an internal inventory, for me, it was all the elements of marketing that always were the most exciting. It has creativity. It has data, analytics. There's something new going on. It's always um, a challenge. Um, you can be innovative, all of that. And those are the things that drive me every day. I always like a crazy challenge. Um, and so I decided about 10 years ago to just focus on a career in marketing said, you know, that is where I want to go. I want to reach the top. I want to be the best at my metier. I want to have the most expertise possible in marketing. And from there on, that's what I pursued. And I looked for challenges. I looked for things that scared me. I looked for things that were way about, way out of my comfort zone. Um, And uh, I think that's how I got to where I was. And then I decided at one point, you know, after I'd gotten there, that that was good. (laughs) And that it's also good to plan a next phase after you sort of reach a mountaintop on one side, where do you go next? Yeah. I love what you said about finding things in your career that present you challenges and even things that you might be afraid of. Do you think that a lot of people stop climbing the ladder because they hit a level of comfort and and they don't want to move forward anymore? What do you think drives that passion to continue to find things that make you fearful? Yeah, I think um, and I think I was lucky. Early on, I discovered that any time I made it through something that terrified me, when I actually got to the other side, and you always get to the other side, all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, now I can do that. So like, I remember my first year I worked at McDonald's. McDonald's was a very big job. I was a head of marketing um, the, for, the Uni- for the U.S., and a lot of what that entailed was huge presentations to 500, a thousand people on a regular basis on challenging topics and, you know, sort of trying to move things along and, and, and push for transformation. It was terrifying, especially as I didn't know. And I realized that, I mean, I would go up to those presentations, sweating, palm sweating, you know, you feel your heart rate going, you're like, you're going, God, I hope I remember everything I need to say and hit all my good points. But then I, then you learn a way to help, yourself get through that almost like tactics of, you Mm. know, breathing beforehand and practicing four or five times so that you really know your material and all of that. And then suddenly you get to the other side and it's this, um, it's like a whole opening of your own internal possibilities and potential and what you can do. And so then I started figuring out that actually there's a method to that to challenging yourself. And every time you do it, you grow further. 
And so even now, as I go into what I'm calling my performance stage, I'm trying to only do what I prefer to do, not retire because I'm pretty active still, but just very different. You know, that's what I'm looking for still, those things that challenge you. And um, it's amazing. There's no lack of things that are new and different um, that I can still find to grow into. I love that. I think one of the the single biggest things that causes people to to have trouble in their career is how to handle failure or how to handle a really difficult situation. So they might run up against something and throw their hands up instead of actually trying to face it head on. I I know that you're a, a tremendous advocate for business owners, specifically women in business. What are what are some of the advice points that you give to people as they're coming up against a really difficult challenge and, and how to address that? Because I'm sure you've had no shortage of, you know, problems or challenges that they've brought you in to solve. So what are some tips that you have for people that might be running up against something similar? Yeah, I think first of all, we we all write our own story. Um, and that's really important because it's not anything that happens to you that defines who you are. Mm. Um, I always tell my son, um, you know, I failed at pretty much everything that uh, I tried to do. I had to apply to most of my jobs twice. I had to apply to business school twice. I, um, you know, I started at one college and then went to another college. Um, and people hear that because, you know, they look at your background that, wow, you did all these things. But everything took a lot of work and a lot of effort. And I failed more than I succeeded. So I always tell people that because the failures are actually what help the growth and, and provide the biggest moments of learning and, and opportunity. So don't be afraid of failure. I always say uh, we used to do failure fiestas, celebrate them uh, and, and go on. And then um, second, I think uh, a, a career is what you decide you make of it. What do you want to achieve um, in transformation? I have always had very clear goals for each of my jobs. Um, and sometimes that put me in conflict with others. <laughs> sometimes that was uh, really hard. And, you know, you win half the battles and you lose half the battles. But I think in the end, it depends every day what how you feel about yourself. Did you go in with the right intention? Did you work with people? Did you try to um, do the best you could every day? And that's how you should think about yourself in a career. And then finally, uh, my third piece of advice to everyone is um, there's no silver bullet. It is relationships and people that make all the amazing growth, transformation, um, important things happen in the world of business and pr frankly, in any world. So uh, don't neglect those relationships and um, opportunities because we can't really do anything on our own. And so our careers and what we do is all dependent on, on that. So spend enough time and devote enough time in your daily lives to those building those relationships. I love that. That's excellent advice. I want to I want to go a little bit more niche into into you know your your background as a marketer and and dealing with difficult complex issues. A lot of people that listen to this show are small business owners. Marketing is something that you know they have to wear a ton of different hats. You know, not only are they the salesperson and the CEO and the marketer, it's it's a really interesting marketplace because everything's always evolving. And obviously, when you're when you're, you know, the, the top of the line for GM and you have to not only deal with local currents and how they change, you have to deal with international currents as well. But I think there's a lot of principles that probably apply from that large scale marketing that small business owners can can utilize. So tell me a little bit about how you handled major shifts in the marketplace. And I guess one, how you stayed ahead of them and then what you did to you know, enact change and, and get the company where it needed to be? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I have um, a few philosophies that I always um, kept at the core, no matter what business I was doing. So I, I advise everyone to really think hard about things that have worked in your life and business um, that you hold true, because they usually go through for any. So for instance, one of mine was because I deal mostly be biz, business to consumer businesses and work with consumers, not as much B2B, but really keep the center at every, keep the customer at the center of everything I do because 
if you create value for that customer, they'll create value for you. So that sounds so obvious, but it's not as easy in day-to-day practice as you're buffeted by financials or cash flow needs or all of those decisions you have to make. But I think keeping that eye on um, what truly a customer will value and why, and then how you can deliver that is super important. And then uh, my other philosophy was um, make sure you go, you move uh, fun with fun, fast, and flexibly, because you always have to be on your toes no matter what strategy that you have. So um, with those two things, I would take that forward. And then the next piece of that is, all right, you no matter the size of your business, communication is critical. Having a core value that you can talk about that your consumer will respond to and making sure that that's a consistent approach in everything that you do, all your communication, whether you're doing it one-to-one, one-to-many, whether you're doing it digitally, whether you can afford something larger, especially online these days, you have to really be precise about what those messages are. And then I've always told everyone, stay consistent with those and the value because repetition works. (laughs) It's really simple. But a lot of um, uh, businesses don't spend enough time on the positioning of their product, on the value that it provides to their customers, and making sure that they're in the right sweet spot and then repeating, repeating, repeating. Um, As a business leader, a CEO, CMO, I always told everyone, you know, you're probably going to get really bored with what you're saying but that doesn't mean everyone else is. So you should be able to repeat the same thing over and over again with that core value proposition for years. Um, And that's what creates that consistency and repetition actually does create value. So do the work up front, really understand what your customers value and then stay consistent. I wanna transition to social media for a moment. That's, That's obviously a large part in the digital marketing space. Now, because, and this is the same for me when I first started engaging in marketing, social media wasn't nearly as big of an industry as it is now. What are some things that you did to handle that transition for GM? Uh, and really just in overall, I know you've worked with several different companies, but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's just like when people had to go from, you know, print to radio and radio to TV and radio to digital. There's a lot of universal principles that I think stick with, uh, stick with marketers. But if people are leveraging too much of a, of an outdated media source, they're going to quickly you know, fade away. So what are some tips that you have for people on dealing with changing media platforms? Yeah. Um, I think one, if you're in the marketing world, that's, is the excitement of it. It does change all the time. In fact, in over my career, the last 30, 40, I I can't believe how much change and how much has been different. What stayed true is that you still have to reach out to customers and find a way to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. So again, keeping an eye and moving with your customers is really important. What I found through most of my career marketing is that the customer was always ahead of everyone else. Um, And so it was always, you know, how do you um, catch up and move quickly? And the second is, I think those core strategic principles of positioning hold true for no matter what media you are. But then, of course, you have to adjust how that message is delivered. So, um, you know, I've gone through the phase of everything was TV commercials, 30 second to 60 second. uh, And those had a certain formula about them and you knew how to do them and you could make them beautiful. Today, it's much more impactful to have an incredibly Uh, functional website, to have um, your Instagram or TikTok feeds that can communicate those same core messages, but in the way that is relevant to the audience today. So I think that's the whole challenge of it. You have to stay up with it, be willing to change your tactics quickly, fast, fun, and flexible, and and move really fast and and not be afraid actually to uh, change your mixes. Now, that said, It's also really important. There are some things that traditional media is very good at. For some things, radio is great. You know, so I think you can't say that there's absolutely nothing to do or all has to be social or all has to be traditional. I think, again, it's really knowing your customer, understanding where they're getting info, what changes that makes it fun and challenging. 
Um, and while that's, so there's no, unfortunately I can't give a specific formula, um, but that's what we found. I'll share an experience at McDonald's when we did the biggest transformation there. Um, the first thing I asked everyone was, well, what's the biggest thing um, everyone's asking for on social media? And so we actually combed through that. And this was, you know, eight years ago, eight or nine years ago now. And they said, everyone wants all day breakfast. I was like, really? That's it? That seems so simple. <laughs> all day breakfast. <laughs> and we found a way to deliver that and, and communicate that um, very effectively. But what was most important was once we found that insight, then it took a lot of operational production. It's, it's very challenging to actually cook eggs and hamburgers at the same time. <laughs> and so, you know, then there was about a year spent on the operational um, aspects to make it right. And I give huge credit to the franchisees and the whole operations team for figuring out how to do that. And then um, it was really, again, making sure that the communication was in the channels and from that time on, McDonald's started an app. They did digital menu boards. I mean, all kinds of interesting things that completely changed the way the traditional mix of media was perceived to all mm. these other values that were really important. So I think it's important to look at all those, move quickly, don't be afraid to experiment, and just keep following your customer. That's fantastic advice. I uh, recently we were, I was on a film shoot and one of my employees had asked me um, why we never use billboards for our clients. And she's like, do you really hate billboards that much? And I'm like, well, for our clients, it doesn't make sense because of the type of industry that they're in. But billboards have tremendous value for certain businesses. You know, and and I was walking through kind of the the breakdown of of which businesses it works for, in my opinion, and which ones it does not. But to your point, radio is a fantastic media outlet for some businesses. So is television. So is over the top media, digital on Facebook, Instagram. It just depends, and that's going back to your point, Deborah, of of knowing the customer. And I love that you know mcdonald's is going through social media comments what does everybody want all right great it's going to be i don't know one year two years until we can operationally make that happen but it's in the works because we're listening to the feedback and that's a really difficult job for a marketer is sorting the good feedback from the bad feedback because if uh, on the other side if you take the bad feedback and you operationally spin something up that's going to be a disaster you know it's, it's a different conversation so it's that's where that self-awareness, listening to the customer, all of those things need to blend together perfectly. And it sounds like, sounds like you've had a pretty tremendous team uh, on your side as well, pretty much through your whole career, which is, which is a huge asset. Right. I think that's really important. And it, it, it's a tightrope right now. I mean, it's, mm. it's not easy. That's why I always say, you know, you, if you focus on, on the core um, values, I mean, uh, this is no surprise. I, I'm a big believer in the transition to EVs. Um, mm -hmm. If you've driven EVs, they're amazing. Like they drive better than anything. <laughs> it's smooth. It's immediate. There's no shift shock. There's immediate acceleration. The handling's incredible. Um, and, and you know, and then there's so many benefits that will come to everyone overall. Now that's a hard topic because there's a lot of people who are like, no, we don't need EVs. We can't transition. I mean, it's, it can be very fraught. So, you know, something that I thought was really important always is you focus on what are the core benefits and values to your consumers? What are people really looking for so that their personal experience is incredible and easy and it makes life better and it creates more value in their lives. Uh, and I think that's important if it's a challenging topic, if it's one that could be on the edge, you know, if you know your customers and know what they really love um, and then are delivering products and services that fit that, then you're sure to be on a path to growth. Fantastic. I want to transition a little bit to, uh, you call it as a preferment, uh, yes. as I love that. That's, that's a fantastic phrase. I think people need to start using it more. Um, so when you left, uh, General Motors, you, uh, started working with more board of directors. Uh, I would imagine from, from an advising perspective, helping people make sure that they have all the right pieces in place. Talk to me about the work that you're doing on, on those boards and, I guess why you chose to move into that direction. 
Yeah. Um, I think I, I want to wind back a few years. And I told you that I have these moments of introspection, you know, once a decade or something. And um, in maybe about almost, yeah, about almost 10 years ago now, I really decided what would I want my next phase to be? So I think you have to really plan um, to get your next phase. And I came back to Detroit Homecoming, you know, Detroit Homecoming, amazing um, uh, event sponsored by Cranes and Mary Kramer. Um, and I was an expat at the time. I had been born and raised in Detroit and left for you know decades. And I came back and I was so impressed by the community and the actions that people from here were taking to grow Detroit and grow our community overall and change the state and make it um, something incredible that I, at that time, set my goal that I wanted to come back here because this is where I would find my community again, reconnect with my roots. And then, as I said, I'm a Detroit advocate. I try to um, focus and help. So I set that plan in place, you know, about in 2015. And it takes a while um, to achieve something like that. So once I decide that, I had also said I would try to reach the top of my metier. Um, and I felt like I had achieved that at General Motors. And when it was time to leave General Motors and, and it was an opportune <laughs> time, I would say, they um, then you can really start putting into action all the other things that you've always wanted to do. So for me, it's, it's a combination of three things, board um, work so that you still, for me, it keeps my mind sharp. I can do governance. I can take the experience that I've had and bring it to other companies, which I find really exciting. And I'm in some of my passion points because I'm working on some MarTech boards that are following up on all the things that I was extremely passionate about. Uh, and then my other are sort of my philanthropic boards that are all Detroit and Michigan um, mm. focused, uh, because I think that's an important part. And then uh, the third leg that I have now is time with friends, community, family that, you know, over 40 years of nonstop working, I never had time. So um, I find this to be uh, a really great way to use all those things that, you know, you might have worked on through your whole life and then think about wh what do you want to do in the next active phase that might be very different. And I really suggest planning like 10 or 20 years ahead <laughs> and that's okay to do that. And you should. Yeah. I would, I would imagine that people might feel that it's uh, if, you, if you're planning 10 years out that man, I, uh, who knows what's going to happen, but that's kind of the point is you're at least aiming for a direction and you might not hit that exact target in 10 years. It might be 12 or 15, but if you don't think about it, you know, it's going to be kind of wandering aimlessly. Right. Right. And, and you probably have, I mean, I think for me, my parents passed away in their eighties a uh, year and a half ago. I just turned 60 and you look at it and actually, you know, we have decades where we'll probably be able to do things. And then I read this great book. I'm going to do a PSA. This is called Roar. Yeah by Michael Clinton. It's a great book that actually talks about how can you plan this out and what should you do and the things that people were able to evolve into. Now, there are a lot of really high achievers in this book, so it was uh, frankly a bit intimidating, but inspiring no, nonetheless. And, um, and so I just want to pass that on because I think it's really interesting. A career does not define you. One job does not define you. How you make choices in your life defines you. Um, and you should do that along with your values and what's important to you at certain times. So if you think about it and plan, I think it can be extremely rewarding. Excellent. So I know uh, Detroit advocate. So I want to, I want to close on something, uh, on the, on the, on the lighter side of, uh, do you follow Detroit sports? Yes, I do. Excellent. So what's your, what's your prediction for the lions this year? Looking we're, going, we're going far. We're going far. I am, um, you know, I, I have to admit, you know, it started for me with hard knocks. Thank God for that. So I could really mm. get to know the characters, which again, speaks to the value of the marketing profession. Getting to know everyone was amazing. I've, um, I've gone to three, two games already. We're going to two more, which I'm very excited about. And, uh, and, I just love um, 
the fight, the energy, and the approach that I see Dan Campbell and the team taking. So I'm like, come on, Lions, let's yeah. go. Here's for Thanksgiving game this year. It was a very impressive win yesterday. So we're recording this on October 2nd in case uh, someone, this comes out after a loss, God forbid. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, you know, we we got the, the Green Bay Packers, so let's go again. We're going to see yep. them again on Thanksgiving Day. Absolutely. It's a good, it's a good time for Detroit sports. I'm excited. I'm a huge basketball fan. So I'm excited to see how Cade Cunningham comes back this year for the Pistons. And it's uh it's a good time to be a Detroit sports fan. Absolutely. And it's a good time for everything Detroit. Um, you know, I encourage everyone spend more time, go downtown, um, experience our great city. It's, it's so fun, lively, and there's so much to do there. There's a huge resurgence. I had a few clients come up from Louisville and they, they specifically wanted to make a couple of days in Detroit just to hang out and look at the city and, and do the tourist thing. And they loved it. I had a great time. And there's a resurgence in Detroit and I'm, I'm happy to see it. I'm um, part of a women's group that's called the International Women's Forum. It's a, it's a group of global f- women executives from all over the world. We're actually having our first IWF annual concert conference this week in Detroit. First time ever, we're going to welcome 800 people from around the United States and around the world to our city. And we're really going to show them what's happening here and why this is a vital place for future employment, for future opportunities, for investment. Um, And I'm really, really proud and thankful that the IWF leadership is coming here because this is the sort of thing that puts our city on the map and helps us grow even further. That's fantastic. Well, I I love it. Thank you so much, Deborah, for your time today, walking me through your history, uh, all the excellent advice that you share. And I'm sure it's going to be helpful to our listeners. Um, Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the Chamber Podcast. We'll see you next week. Take care.